Matthew 8. So I got a little lazy this week, and because last week I preached out of the NLT, we're going to continue to look at this verse in the NLT, because all my, I got to look at last week's notes to go into this week's, and I didn't want to recopy. I'm not much of a transcriber. So I'm going to read to you from the New Living Translation. That may or may not matter at all to you. But we're going to look at Matthew 8, verses 23 to 27. <coughs> Excuse me. This is not for effect. That one was practical. My throat tickles. Matthew 8, 23 to 27. He records for us, Then Jesus got into the boat and started across the lake with his disciples. Suddenly a fierce storm struck the lake with waves breaking into the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, woke him up shouting, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. But Jesus responded, Why are you afraid? You have so little faith. <clears throat> then he got up and he rebuked the wind and the waves and suddenly there was a great calm. The disciples were amazed and they asked, even the winds, uh, they, they were amazed. Who is this man, they asked. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Short verse. You're hoping. Short sermon. No, no, no. That's not how I operate. <clears throat> this story comes on the heels of the one I preached last week. Jesus is bugged out by the crowds. He's worn out. He's exhausted from ministering, healing sick people, casting out demons. And he says, get in the boat. We're going to the other side of the other side of the lake, okay? That's going to be crucial here in a minute. Get in the boat, we're going to the other side of the lake, on the lake. On the way down to the boat, a scribe, a PhD in the Jewish law, comes up to Jesus and says, I'll follow you wherever you, will go, wherever you go. And he's like, settle down, Leroy. I don't got a bed. Like, I just left Pete's house. That's where I crashed last night. I don't know where I'm going to sleep tonight. Foxes have holes. Birds have nests. I got nowhere to lay my head. And we get the impression from the text, he didn't follow after that. Another guy come up to him. Apparently, same idea. I'll follow wherever you go. But first, just, I got this, I want to take care of my pops while he's still here. It's important to me. I really care about him. Uh, once I bury him, I'll follow you. Jesus says, let the spiritually dead, right? Let those who don't know me bury their dead. The most important thing is to follow me. And on that, Jesus leaves them, apparently behind, and he gets into the boat. Jesus gets into the boat to start across the lake. <clears throat> and the, N the NLT, the way I read it, it says uh, he went across the lake with his disciples. The Greek, you may have a more literal translation, New King James, King James, something like that. It literally means the disciples followed him. Now, this may not seem like that big of an issue. The disciples followed him. They're disciples. That's what we're supposed to do, Right? But I want to highlight, they did follow him, unlike the two guys who we just talked to. They apparently left. These guys get into the boat with Jesus. They followed him. As they follow him, a fierce storm comes up on the Sea of Galilee. So, John, uh, slide number uno. Okay? This is, <laughs> this is a picture I grabbed off the internet of the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is 13 miles long by about 8 miles wide. It sits about 600 to 700 feet below sea level. And it's surrounded all around it by mountains. You can see that. This is where we're starting, up here in Capernaum, and they're going to end up down here in Gergasa. This is the story that comes next. Okay. The reason that this matters is suddenly a storm comes up. A lot of times, Storms come, and we can see them coming. We have scientists who are right about 30% of the time in predicting the storms in our lives, right? They wouldn't have saw this one coming because the way the sea sits below the, below the mountains, and you can see the Mediterranean Sea over there, what happens a lot of times is the warm air that sits in this bowl created by the mountains gets met by cool air coming in off the Mediterranean Sea, and when the cold air comes in and the warm air comes up, you get a sudden storm. It happens a lot on the Sea of Galilee. It's known for this. So, and because of the position way down low inside that, 
you can't often see the storm that's coming in. It's hidden from your view. And there's this really cool, where's Mount, uh, I'm not sure. Over here, Beatitudes, it's going to be on this, Mount um, Arbel, Arbel. There's this little narrow passageway that comes through there. And the way it was described to me is when the wind blows through this, this cavern that comes down into it, it's like, uh, it's like the carburetor forcing gas and air together inside an engine. Like the combustion that happens, when that, that's what it's like when the, the cold air like rushes into and meets the warm air and these giant storms come up. I point this out to say sometimes we can see the storms coming in our life. My intent is not to focus a ton on the storm because that's what preachers always do, right? You can't talk about this without the storm, but this storm to, or this passage to me is, has three themes, discipleship, faith, and the person of Jesus Christ, okay? We already established the disciples got into the boat with him. He, the storm comes up, it catches them off guard. This is their home water. They grew up, James, uh, James and John, Peter and Andrew. This is where they fish. They live up in Capernaum and Bethsaida. Uh, Capernaum. They fish these waters all the time, but a lot of times they stay on the shallow side because that's where the fish are. R Ryan, the lakes that you fish all the time, do you know where the fish are? Largely, right? You'll explore new water here and there, but you have confidence when you fish your home water about where to be. They don't often go to the middle of the lake because that's not where the big schools of fish are. Fish are in the shallows at night, and that's when they fished. They are now in the middle of the lake with Jesus, and there's a storm. The, the word that Matthew uses here for storm is not the typical word for storm. It's actually seismos. Seismos, Jack. Sounds like seismic. Sounds like or earthquake. That's what it means. A violent shaking came upon the boat out of nowhere. They didn't see it coming. And Jesus, we take a little siesta. Like, I love it. I love, it, it, I've seen it on a t-shirt, Jesus took naps, be like Jesus, right? Mark records this story, and he adds a couple details that Matthew doesn't include. Mark lets us know that Jesus was sleeping on a cushion. Boats can't be all that comfortable. They're made of wood. Jesus wanted to be comfortable in his uh, seismic siesta. He also, Mark also tells us that there were other boats behind him, that there were other boats with him on the lake, which makes sense. Jesus has got crowds of people following him. There were other, Matthew doesn't include that detail. I just want you to know that there were other boats there. So they, they experienced this storm too. They just didn't have Jesus in the boat. They followed him across the lake because he's healing people and casting out demons. It's easy to follow Jesus in the church house and at the conference and at the concert when you've got people surrounding you. It's easy to be a part of the crowd, to feel like you're in something. Sometimes we go through storms and... We feel alone. We don't have everyone around us. Sometimes we go through storms alone and Jesus seems like he's asleep. That's why I read Psalm 121 this morning. Not because I knew Rick, what uh, Ricky was playing. Where does my help come from? I lift my eyes unto the hills. They're surrounded by hills. Where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord. The maker of heaven and earth. Go the, uh, John, pull up Rembrandt. This is a Rembrandt's depiction of uh, Christ in the Sea of Galilee. And I don't think that's quite the boat with the sails and all that, but everyone in the boat is freaking out, and this is Jesus. Everyone, man in the sails, you know, all that stuff. And, like, they just woke him up. Jesus like, what's up? Right, that's how, I don't wake up well. No, Lynette's like, Amen. It takes, if I take a nap in the middle of the day I'm, and I wake up at two, I'm not fully awake until about five, until I come to. I don't nap well. But this is an artist's rendering of how violent the storm was that they found themselves in. But they were in the boat. Now, <clears throat> these guys are at home, on their lake, 
where they're used to, but they're out of their element. They're in the deep water in the middle of the lake, not on the shore, the side of the shore where it's going to be, or where they're, where they're used to being. And that's where they're at when the storm comes up. Jesus is asleep, naturally. It gets to the point where they can't handle it themselves. Then they go get Jesus. Can anyone relate to that? My problems have finally gotten beyond the point that I feel comfortable dealing with them. It's outside of my skill set. Jesus, help me! Yeah. That's me. Right? Because, John, bring up the, u- the use of force model. We use this at the prison. This is, it's called the use of force model, and what we're authorized to do in an emergency or crisis situation is use the amount of force necessary to control the, the situation that we're facing. Most of the time, we operate in the blue and the green. Okay? Leave that up. I'll refer to it again in a minute. But how much faith did it take for the disciples to get into the boat with Jesus? How much? They're fishermen. Probably very little, right? They are not worried at all about getting into the boat with Jesus. They're down here, right? They are following Jesus into a boat to go to the other side. How many of us live our lives like the fishermen? Just getting into a boat. How many of you get into a car to go somewhere that you go to every day? Maybe it's work, maybe it's you know, the grocery store, whatever. And when you get there, you go, man, how did I get here? You ever been there? Your brain goes on autopilot. I can tell you right now, if I got in my car from my driveway, I'm going to turn left, I'm going to turn right, I'm going to turn left, I'm going to turn left, I'm going to turn right, I'm going to turn right, I'm going to park my car, and I'm at work. I can do it, I could probably do it with my eyes closed, which is scary that we can be so checked out of when we're driving. But we do this because it requires, we feel on our part, very little faith to do that one thing. Until your dad, who's been driving for 60 years, has an accident that he, by all rights, could have killed him, right? Had it not been for Psalm 91, prayed over him, and God having mercy on his life, sparing him and Bert, then you realize in that moment how much faith it really takes in unseen forces to live your life as a follower of Jesus. So as you go up, <clears throat> this is where we live in the faith and these cooperative controls. Inmates are compliant, so you just talk to them like normal people. If they become passive resistant, sucking their teeth and just slow walking and not wanting to go anywhere, you go, hey, yo-yo, keep moving, right? We've got to shut this down in a minute. You're just gonna, you're gonna use a level of force just commensurate or just above what they're presenting with. The higher you go up, so they're active resistant, now they're squaring off, what have I done? I've unsnapped my gas, I've got my radio right here, and I'm getting ready to give some more direct commands, right? You're gonna move on. As they ratchet it up, you go one step higher, all the way up to lethal force, okay? As the storm comes, what initially required little faith whatsoever to get into the boat and follow Jesus now becomes an, episode, or an exercise in, dear God, help us, we're going to die. Right? To quote the, the prophet Ron Burgundy, well, that escalated quickly. <clears throat> because we can live our lives as followers of Jesus as if practically we don't need him. But we know better. And they found out real quick that there's... I feel like this distinction needs to be made. I'm saying disciple and Christ follower. I'm not saying Christian. Because I want to make a distinction that not everyone that calls themselves as a, Christ, a Christian is a Christ follower. There is a nominal connection to Christ just by being like culturally Christian, having a religious background, knowing about God, but what makes you a Christian is knowing God. And you can be a quote-unquote, right, Christian without being a Christ follower, but you cannot be a Christ follower without being a Christian, like knowing Him. 
And there's a difference. Jesus, when they wake him up, when they're like, they're shaking him up out of his slumber, and Jesus waking the sleepers up out of his eyes, because apparently old boy can sleep in the middle of a storm and be absolutely fine. They wake him up because they're going to die. They're fearing for their lives. And the first thing he does is look at them and go, what? You have little faith. Now, the disciples get picked on a lot because of, they had, they had Jesus in the boat. They just watched a guy cure leprosy and heal the, you know, heal the centurion servant, heal other diseases and cast out demons. What do you mean they didn't get it? Wait, what, do you, what did they expect him to do when he woke up? They're just waking him up. They didn't ask him to still the wind and the waves. They just asked him to do something, right? Save us. We're going to drown. <coughs> Excuse me. But before he does anything about the storm, he deals with the people. You of little faith. And I'm not going to pick on them because of their little faith. You know why? They're in the boat. The guys that he dealt with beforehand, when they counted the cost, they didn't want to pay it. That's the thing about being a Christian in the church house or being a Christian at the conference or a Christian in the conference. Right? It's easy. But when you're alone and you have to, you have to reconcile the same question we're going to talk about, who is this man? When you have to reckon with that one, and your faith now is going to cost you something. Are you willing to pony up? The disciples, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, four fishermen, left their boats and their business to follow Jesus. So when he talks about their little faith, it literally in the Greek it means little faith ones. Ones of little faith. It doesn't take a lot of faith to follow Jesus. It only takes a little faith. Because as you follow Jesus, He will increase that faith. As you place more of it in Him, you surrender more of yourself to Him, He will increase the faith. So that, um, so that the things that used to worry you, and bother you, and beset you, and wake you up at night, and keep you, keep you up at night, seem a lot smaller. Right? The things of this world grow strangely dim. Did I misquote it again? I got it right that time. Right? Fix, keep your eyes on Jesus. Turn. Turn your eyes toward Jesus. I misquoted it last week. Turn your eyes towards Jesus. And the things of this world grow strangely dim. Go, grow strangely dim. That's the faith that he gives you in following him. The disciples, their faith is going to increase as they follow him. But in this moment, they're going, what do I do? What, what? Jesus has to deal with that before he takes care of it. Now, you can do the Jesus thing, like, did he know the storm was coming? And, and, but because he's the God of the storm. Uh, and... It doesn't matter what you do, like what you think about Jesus is foreknowledge of the storm or not. He was still asleep in it and the disciples were freaking out. Here's what we do. And here's where the faith thing comes in. It's a lot of fun. They're in a boat on a storm because of an act of obedience. They follow Jesus. Jesus says, get in the boat. We're going to the other side of the lake. Okay? They're in the violent seismic storm because they obeyed the voice of the Lord. American Christianity says... God, I'm following you. Remove and eliminate all the storms from my life. Does not happen that way. They're there because they obeyed Jesus. All right, let that one marinate and sink in a little bit. So what we do when we go through our storms is we go to God's Word at some point. Or we'll go to a friend who hopefully is a Christian is providing godly counsel. And as I was studying it this morning, God brought up Jonah. Okay? In Jonah chapter 1, Jonah runs away from God and finds himself on a boat in the middle of the sea where a giant storm comes up on him. Okay? What the disciples aren't doing inside the boat is holding a Bible study and quoting the verses back to God about the prophet Jonah 
who was on the boat, going, sitting there and going, won't he do it? Right? You did it once, you'll do it again. They're not. They freak out like we do. So we have faith not in... Okay, it's going to be a little tricky, so don't hear what I'm not saying. We don't have faith in the text. Well, the text is authority, has authority in our lives. Only as it reveals to us the author. I don't have faith in the outcome, although I believe for it. I have faith in the person to make the outcome happen. Does that make sense? Because I want to make sure I say that well. I don't have faith in the outcome. I have faith in the person. That's why they didn't sit there and say that, like, declare the sea to be calm. They went to the one who could make it calm. Whether they thought he was going to do it or not, they have faith in the person of God and what he will do. Faith is, a, faith is an interesting thing that way. See, the reason God brought Jonah up is because he says one greater than Jonah is here. The religious leaders in a couple of chapters are going to say, hey, give us a sign. And he goes, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. But no, no sign is going to be given you except that of the prophet Jonah, right? Who was in the belly of a whale for three days. And then he says, I tell you, one greater than Jonah is here. Jonah got thrown overboard and the sea was calmed down by God because God brought the storm on him in the first place because Jonah was like, he told everyone on the boat, I'm running from God. So when they're freaking out, skilled sailors, probably on their home water, storm comes up and they're praying to their fake gods going, no, we don't know what to do. So they wake up Jonah who's asleep in the boat. Like the parallels here are crazy. But the reality is God brought the storm onto the boat with Jonah because of an act of disobedience and the, the, the disciples found themselves in the middle of a storm because of an act of obedience. But it's the same God that calmed down the storms. This storm caught them off guard. Sometimes the storms in our lives do not catch us off guard. Sometimes we're the author of our own storm. There were the, the sailors on the boat and Jonah, they were part of the storm as collateral damage because of Jonah's disobedience. The people who were following Jesus in the boat here, they were caught in the storm because they, uh, they were collateral damage, because they sought to follow Christ across the lake. Sometimes the storms catch us completely off guard. Sometimes we know exactly why they happened. But the outcome can be the same if our faith is in the person. Okay? We know what we want to happen, but it's not going to happen if we do not fix our eyes upon Jesus. Turn them, fix them. So, <clears throat> the story is about those who would follow Jesus, who have left everything to follow him, even though the critique is, you have little faith. That's okay. You have to start somewhere. Uh, when I got saved, I went bananas for like four years, five years, studying the Bible, because it was, the opportunity was there all the time. Quiz team, uh, youth group, all of the things that I could do to get my hands on the Bible. Then I went to college and I studied the Bible. And mom, I'll never forget the day when I called home and I said, hey, I have declared my major. And yay. And uh, she said, what are you going to study? I said, I'm going to study religion. Good Lord, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> I didn't know either. I just love, so then I declared a minor in criminal justice because even though I would like to study religion, I knew I was going to need to get a job and didn't want to be a pastor. Joke's on me. <laughs> now I pastor in a prison. Uh, <clears throat> but after I graduated, I'm ashamed to say my prayer life and my scripture study went stagnant for a while. Right? I took off like a rocket. And then I plateaued. And I went to church and I checked the box and I did all the things that a Christian is supposed to do. But uh, there was probably, <laughs> was it Spurgeon? Spurgeon, <laughs> probably. I'm going to say it was anyway. He says, most people's Bibles have enough dust on the cover to write damned. Like, that could have been me. I didn't even take my Bible to church with me when I went. Because you've got to be in this. You've got to know the God who wrote it. So that's where the faith comes in, right? It's okay to have a little bit of faith, but keep progressing and keep following. And God will keep showing up 
and honestly, calming down storms. The last thing I want to highlight is this, this story is not about so much about the storm as it is about the person of Jesus Christ. Right? It's discipleship, people who follow him. It's faith, faith in him. But every person in verse 27 has to reconcile with this question. The disciples were amazed. We don't get amazed anymore. Just record, like full disclosure. We don't, nothing shocks us. You feel that way? Like you see some crazy news story and you're like, yeah, doesn't surprise me at all. Right? Let me tell you the last time that I got shocked because of something I saw online. Right? Quick scan, okay. So, there was a man who was bragging about his desire to be the first transgender woman to have an abortion. And then, then enumerated what that meant. I was born a man, I feel like I'm a woman. I want to go through the surgeries to have all the stuff put inside me to kiss a man like mommies and daddies kiss to make a baby so that I can be the first transgender man to kill the baby inside my abdomen. I was amazed. I could not believe the evil that enabled that thought process to happen, that process to happen, okay? We don't do amazed anymore. We'll get caught off guard by much. The disciples see what happens when Jesus wakes up because he doesn't talk to the storm until he deals with them. That's a good word. It's not part of my notes. But Jesus doesn't calm the storm until he deals with the individual and their faith or lack thereof. Jesus doesn't deal with the storm in the story or our lives until he deals with us first. And then they're amazed and they ask, what sort of man is this? Who is this man is how it's rendered here. And that's the question that every single person, not in this room exclusively, but every single person that ever walked, walks, or will walk on this earth will have to reckon with. Who is this man? So it tells me that this story is Christological in nature. Christological, fancy theology word for it's all about Christ, the study of Christ. It's about the person of who he is. We learn about his character in here, that he desires people to follow him with their whole heart. He doesn't want some half-hearted commitment, quick to promise or uh, slow to perform. He wants people who will follow him, who even with enough faith to get into the boat will get into the boat with him and not hold anything back. They want people who will go into uncharted waters with him, though everything in their life is familiar, that they will go cast out into the deep to get to where they want to go. Because in verse 8, Jesus says, get into the boat, we're going to the other side. Jesus did not tell his disciples, I want you to get into the boat because we're going to go halfway across and drown. It's important to know what Jesus said, to hold on to the promises that he's given you. He did not say, we're going to get into the boat, we're going to go halfway across and drown. The Word word says that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to see it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. It does not say, he who began a good work in you will get halfway through and lose interest and peter out and quit. God will not quit on you. Do not quit on him. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Right? Draw near to God and he will close the gap. That's what that means. We will all have to reckon with the person of Jesus Christ. And this story is about who he is, what he wants. He wants people to follow him with their whole heart, to give it all up, to be willing to get uncomfortable, to be able to, even in the midst, to follow him and be caught by a storm and turn to him and let him work in us and then calm our storm. And when we're in him, we can confidently say that I have been crucified with Christ. I died with Him. And the life that I live, I now live by, in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself up for me. The life that I live isn't mine anymore. That's what it is to know, to answer that question in the affirmative. Who is this man? It's the man that leads my life and died for me so that I don't... De- Die the death that I deserve to die because he took it on himself. I am hid in Christ. I'm clothed with Christ. The psalmist, where can I go that I won't find you? Heaven, you're there. Hell, you're there. Nowhere, you are there. The storms that I created, you're there. Waiting for me to deal with me in my life so that you can deal with the storm that I've created. 
The storms that come up on you all of a sudden, they're going to come. They're going to come. But Jesus is there waiting to, to look at the little faith that I have and to answer my heart's cry. I'm drowning. God, it seems like you're asleep. Psalm 121 said, The God who watches over Israel neither sleeps nor slumbers. Jesus was exhausted. Jesus the man was exhausted from taking care of a bunch of people that came to be with Him. But the God who watches over your life neither sleeps nor slumbers. You may not feel His presence in the storm, but turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full on His wonderful face, and the things of this world and the storms around you will grow strangely dim in the light of His beauty and grace. I got it right that time. That's how you know the Holy Spirit's going. Right? Guys, I want you to get excited about this as I am. I've had storms in my life that God had to settle my heart before He dealt with. But when He did, I sit back and I go, God, I did not see that coming. The storm or the solution. And He allowed one and wrought the other. To God be the glory. If you don't know Him this morning, if you can't answer this question, what sort of man is this? I don't want you to leave here not knowing today. I want you to leave here not as a Christian, but as a Christ follower. One whose life is gone because you found a new life in Him. Storms are going to come. They're going to come. It was an act of obedience that they found themselves in this one. But the Savior who stills the storm, He's there too. And He went with you before the storm came. And He's going to see you through safely out the other side. Because no promise from the Lord ever fails. Get in the boat. We're going to the other side. Will you go with Him? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your promises, which in Christ are yes and amen. God, thank You that You do not take us halfway and leave us to fend for ourselves and figure it out on our own. But God, that You're with us before the storm, in the storm, and after the storm. And that builds up our faith in You that when the next one comes, we're going to be fine. Thank You for the peace of knowing we're going to be fine as long as we keep our eyes fixed on you. Thank you for your goodness and for your glory. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.